happy to be here. This is my second Maronite worship experience, and it is indeed moving. And I understand you don't have a deacon here, so maybe I will apply. <laughs> if Monsignor allows me to, it is. As uh, the introduction informed you, I have not been Catholic all of my life. In fact, for 59 years of my life, I lived as a Pentecostal. And as uh, for the 25 years of that experience, I worked as a pastor of two churches. Um, it was quite a surprise when I discovered the fullness of, of the faith as it subsists within the Catholic Church. Uh, and it's a long story, and I don't have time to tell you my story, but I think we have some books over there that, uh, no price too high, do we have some books over there? You have a few. DVD, okay, get the DVD because it not only has my first testimony, it also has Dinner with Alex. It's been on EWTN for, for about the last 10 years. The Lord be with you. I love that phrase because it's a greeting. It's a Christian greeting. And I greet you in the name of the Lord. Uh, as I said earlier, raised as a Pentecostal, so many people ask me, why did you become Catholic when so many Catholics are leaving the church? Now, I don't know about Australia, but I have some uh, statistics here that I want to share with you about uh, Catholicism in America. Uh, I think you'll be quite surprised. Uh, Monsignor, I don't know the figures here. Maybe if I'd done a little research, I could have found some figures here. But in America, 100,000 Catholics leave the church a year. 100,000 in favor of evangelical denominations. And these 100,000 converts to evangelical Christianity are taught how to evangelize their families. So they not only become evangelistic or evangelical, they are trained how to witness to their family, witness to their friends, so that they too can share in that evangelical experience. Now, that's working. Now, I don't know if you know too much about American culture or, or the problem, current problem we're having with immigration. Uh, America is on the border with Mexico and so many Mexicans are coming across the border that we're having a problem, an immigration problem of illegal immigrants coming into the country. Tens of thousands have made it and tens of thousands more are trying to come to the country. When they come to America, Mexicans are devout Catholics. I mean, our Catholic population, up to 71 million now, has been boosted by the influx of Hispanics from Mexico, from Mesoamerica, and from South America. But unfortunately, as they come into the country, they too have been targeted by evangelical groups and have been very, very successful, these groups, in recruiting Hispanics. Uh, a 1986 uh, Gallup poll revealed that in the preceding 10 years, 5 million Hispanics joined evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Approximately 30% of the 17 million Hispanics in the United States. Of these, 64% converted to these groups from Catholicism. In New York City, for example, there are at least 2,000 Pentecostal churches whose congregation are predominantly Hispanic. Uh, and the problem, of course, is growing worse as the year go, years go by. As I travel around the country and around the world giving my testimony of why a Pentecostal would want to become Catholic, why would I leave such a powerful faith, such a rich, vibrant faith to become Catholic, I'm always approached wherever I go by somebody who has tears in their eyes who asks me, what should I do? My children have walked away from the church. 
Or they might say, my husband has walked away from the church. Or they might say, my wife has walked away from my church. Or my best friend has walked away from the church. And I was utterly bowled over when I came to understand that the number one church that Catholics go to when they leave their church is the is the Pentecostal church. And here I am coming from a Pentecostal church to the Catholic church. And everybody wants to know why. When so many of them are flooding, well, my God, even as a pastor, I had many Catholics in my church that I had rescued from, from the flames of hell. That I had taught them how to understand the word of God. And, and, and they would often tell me, Pastor, we just love you because you delivered us out of this monstrosity called the Catholic Church. You gave us truth. You led us into biblical truth. And we're so grateful for it. Ironically, when I began to study the Apostolic Fathers and came to the church, I brought them back with me. <laughs> All they needed was a little understanding of the faith they had walked away from. And this is what I'm understanding with so many who walk away. They don't really know or understand or believe their faith. I've met so many teary-eyed parents, teary-eyed uh, 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 spouses who are crying because someone they love has walked away from the church. So tonight I want to do a, uh, a talk on what do we do once they walk away? What do you do once the horse is out of the barn? Now, if you suspect that someone is learning or looking into another faith, you have to work quickly. Because if you don't work quickly, you might lose them forever. There are two kinds of people who walk away from the Catholic Church. And we must differentiate between these two groups. The first group that leave are Catholics who are disenchanted with their church. They don't like church teaching. They don't like the church's teaching on sexuality or homosexuality. They don't like the way the church teaches about uh, marriage and divorce. And therefore, they just walk away. Sometimes they don't like the way the church has changed. Uh, uh, since Vatican II, many Catholics feel that the church has lost its reverence and has now become a new Catholic church, and they've walked away. Uh, my wife's stepfather hated Vatican II. And from the moment that it was finalized in 1965 until the moment of his death, he actively fought against it. He felt that it was a betrayal of the Catholic Church. And of course, he gave his priests fits. His priest actually was smiling at his funeral. <laughs> so many Catholics have walked away from the church because they feel the changes of Vatican II has deluded Catholic faith and has the Catholic Church uh, less than what it once was. So the first group that walk away are those disenchanted Catholics. Um, they do not deny their baptism. They become more or less people who are spiritual but not religious. Have you ever heard of that? You have friends say, you know, I'm spiritual. I believe in God and I believe in the working of the Holy Spirit and I can get as much God in my shower as I can get at church. Or I can get as much God walking by the seashore or the oceans up on the beaches and get as much God as I can from a homily or from any type of church jargon. Well, that's what happens to so many Catholics who walk away. They don't deny their baptism. They acknowledge that they were baptized Catholics, but yeah, 
they don't get that much out of mass. Nah, they don't agree with the teachings of the church. Nah, too much hitting, too many hypocrites in the church. Nah, it just the church is not living up to what it once was. Nah, we have changed because you know times have changed. We've become more educated. We've become more knowledgeable. Therefore, the church is really uh, uh, anachronistic. It's out of step with time. It's old-fashioned. It should change, and because it doesn't change, like I. Feel it should change. I'm just going to stay home and hold my crystals and hum. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes they leave because of family problems. I think one of the number one reasons that some Catholics leave is they have problems in the home. Conflicts between parents, conflict with parents, hypocrisy in the home, some making their children go to church and, and be a part of church and they themselves are not uh, spiritual at all. And children see that and see the folly of that and do not learn that, that the church without their parents is the family of God. They see the church through the eyes of their parents. And if the parents are not living a life of peace and love and justice at mercy at home, kids know about it. How many know kids are sharp? Kids are very discerning. Kids know when you like them and when you don't like them. You can put on a face uh, to, to try to fool kids that you like. Kids are very sharp. And they see in the home, they see that when parents do not live up to what they profess, it has a damaging mark on them. I, I have I never heard of Jeff Cavins. Okay, Jeff Cavins uh, was born a Catholic. He was raised a Catholic up into his college years. But he grew to despise the Catholic Church because his dad was an ardent, devout Catholic. But he was mean. And Jeff said that he was never told him he loved him. He's demanding and domineering and, and, and physically abused his children. So Jeff said, I don't want that kind of religion. And so when he got into college and he met this sweet little Pentecostal girl, she talked him out of the church and he gladly went. And one day, Monsignor, when the bishop was in town talking to his flock, Jeff Caven stood up and said, I'm out of here. This is nothing but a sham. I'm out of here. And he left the church for about 20, 25 years. Thank God he came back. But it was the, the, the discrepancy between his father's life and his father's confession. His father's purported love of the Lord. By the way, Monsignor, that was a great homily today. That was a great homily. I, I, I could have sworn you sneaked into my talk Friday night and took notes. <laughs> and I have to comment when I hear great homilies, and that was a good homily. Surge for God. Can I borrow that? Yes. I can, I'll take that back with me. <laughs> the second reason so many leave the church is that they marry a spouse. They fall in love and marry a spouse that's not Catholic. And that spouse either... Uh, seduce, uh, that's a bad word, not seduce, uh, <laughs> uh, leads them away from the church because they are strong in their belief, and if the Catholic partner is not strong in their belief, then inevitably they will follow. Uh, and many times, family of parents want unity in the home, and uh, they will they will uh, give up the Catholic faith for the sake of unity. So they'll go with their husband or they'll go with their wives to their churches. And so we have married to a spouse as a reason of another faith for many leaving the church. And then we have those who have never gone through conversion. The church was meant to lead you from conversion to conversion to conversion to conversion as you, as you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, as you learn about him, as you grow to love him more and to love one another more. We go through a series of conversions. We're not like, as, as many evangelicals say, there's one big conversion and that's it. No, life is a conversion. Children go through a conversion. They must go through a conversion. 
And if they're not, if you're not converted entirely to love the Lord and to love his church, then as you grow older, it has no meaning to you. It's just a bunch of rules and words. I mean, you hear them all your life and they never register. Because inside, you've not opened that heart to allow the life of God to, to, to grow you, to mold you, to make you what you should be. We cannot be the Christians that we ought to be unless we go through conversion. We must allow, allow the power of the Holy Spirit to take the words that have been spoken to us and to put them in our heart. And that's why the church has the sacrament of confession. Those things that would hinder our hearts from opening, we have an opportunity to get rid of them. And so when uh, children are raised in the church and they're not given the opportunity to read through a conversion, their faith has no meaning to them. And it gets boring. Have you ever heard kids say, I don't like going to church. It's boring. You ever heard that? Now you've heard that. How many times have I heard kids say that? All right. I said it. I hated church. Uh, when I was young, I was baptized, and I loved it. And I hated it. It was boring. I mean, sitting there listening to a guy preach about something, I had no idea what he was talking about. Singing songs that didn't touch me. Same old thing, Sunday after Sunday, and being Pentecostal, Sunday and Tuesday and Friday after Sunday after Tuesday and after Friday. <laughs> and as I grew into my teen years, I hated church. I couldn't tell, even the people in the church would see me and say, he's mad. Because I'd sit there with a scowl on my face. I don't want to be here talking about Jesus. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't go here. Hell is hot, eternity is too long. I don't want to hear all of that. I wanted to enjoy life. I wanted to live. I wanted to party. I wanted to get down. I wanted to boogie. <laughs> but church got in the way. And everything was sin. And I didn't want it. It wasn't until my 16th birthday and the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed me and changed me for all eternity. I had a tremendous conversion at age 16 that everything that I hated, I fell in love with. Now, what did I hate? I hated church. I hated the Bible. I hated prayer. I hated Jesus. I fell in love with them. Those things I love, I turned to hate. What did I love then? I loved drinking till I couldn't see straight. I loved cursing. I love fighting, I love violence, I love immorality, and all those things lost their appeal. When the life of the Holy Spirit entered into my heart and I was converted, that kept me in the church. That kept me from going to Vietnam. If I had not been converted to the Lord, I may not even be here today. I might be dead or so strung out on drugs I wouldn't know my name. But through the power of the Holy Spirit converting me interiorly, my whole faith took on a whole new meaning. All of this talk about Jesus, and now it all made sense. The Bible, the very thing I tried to read and couldn't get past the fifth chapter with all of those funny names. <laughs> now the Bible was talking to me. God was talking to me. I'm in this plan. He's talking to me. When he says, I love you, wow. I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts for good and not for ill, thoughts for a, a, a better end. You're talking to me. So a lot of our kids never have a conversion. They're just raised up in the church. It means nothing to them. And that's across the board, not just Catholic, but that's all faiths. Fourth reason, there are those who disagree with the church's lifestyle. They don't like the church's code of conduct. They think the church should change their code of conduct because they don't feel it's right. I, the thing about sexuality, life below the belt, they don't like the church messing with their personal lives. Don't come into my bedroom. Just talk about Jesus. Don't talk about 
moral ter uh, turpitude. Just talk about Jesus. Don't talk about sin. And so we have those who have progressed and advanced so much, they have advanced and progressed beyond the church. And therefore they drop out of the church because the church is oppressive. The church is oppressing people. The church won't let people have real freedom. No, it's that they don't like what the church proposes. The church teaches about holy living. So that's the first kind of dropout, those who become disenchanted with the church, with its teaching, those who have been married, who, who marry a spouse from another faith, and those who have tensions in their family, and somehow they want no part of the church. How many of you heard of ki heard kids say that when I get, get grown, I'm never going to church? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's because they've never discovered the value of their faith. Now, the second kind of dropout, and this is what I want to end on tonight. The second kind of dropout is that person who is converted in another church, who undergoes a conversion experience in a church other than their parish. Of those other ones that I just talked about, 80% of them may come back. As they get older and as they begin to have children, they want their children to share in their heritage and in their faith, so they bring their kids back. They're older now. The flames of passion have begun to, to cease, and they come back. But when we talk about those who are faith transfers, only... 12% return, 88% never come back. And you hear them say this, I was baptized as a Catholic, but I got born again over at such and such a church. Have you heard that? Yeah. Well, whenever I hear that, Father I, of Monsignor, I have to stop them and say, no, you didn't. You didn't get born again over it at that particular church. You may have gone through a conversion, but you were born again when you were baptized in a Trinitarian baptism. That's your new birth. Our Lord had made it clear. Except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so you were born again when you were baptized, but you went through a conversion experience over at whatever church you were in. That's all it is. Let me give you an example. St. Paul, on his way to Damascus to ravish the church, a light from heaven knocks him to the ground. He hears the voice of the Lord. He sees this brilliant light. He hears the voice of the Lord. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He says, get up and go into the city, and I will tell you what to do when you get there. Now blinded by the light, he stumbles into the city of Damascus. For three days he fasts and prays. Can you imagine the turmoil in his mind and heart? He's been wrong all these years. So now he's praying and he's waiting. In walks a man named Ananias. What does he do? First he instructs him, I've been sent by God to give you your eyesight back and to start you on your way. So he laid hands on him and his eyesight returned. Then what did he do? He said, arise and be baptized and have your sins washed away. In other words, the vision that Paul had on the road was a conversion experience. It was not the new birth. The new birth was not given until Ananias took him and baptized him and washed away his sins. So anyone tell you from now on that they were baptized as Catholic and they got born again, of course they got a conversion or felt good or had a vision, tell them no. Stand up and say, no, you're not. You were born again when you were baptized. And so these people who go to different churches, and let me just warn you, I am very ecumenical. I believe that we're all children of God. 
I believe that Baptists and Pentecostals and Methodists and Baptists are my brothers and sisters. And they indeed they are. I believe they will share heaven with us. I believe they will. I believe they're a part of the church. You see, there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. True! But define Catholic Church. <laughs> Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians are brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh, that was weak. <laughs> Amen? Amen? They are. The church teaches this. But they are imperfectly joined to the church. They are not even considered churches, but ecclesial communities. How many churches are there? One. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God above all and in you all. There's only one church. It's not 23,000 churches. One church. And those who have been baptized through the Trinitarian formula into Christ are Christ. And they are our brothers and sisters. They're just not perfectly joined to the church. To have perfect unity, you need three things. You need same faith, same worship, same government. That's perfect unity. What do we have in common with our Presbyterian and our Baptist brothers and sisters? The same faith. What don't we have in common? Same worship and same government. So we don't have true unity. We have only unity of faith, and it's that unity of faith that makes us brothers and sisters. Now, having said that, I'm very ecumenical. But you beware and be careful of so-called non-denominational Bible studies. They will tell you, oh, we don't discuss denomination here. We just talk about the Bible. And we just let the Bible speak. And we will not try to convert you. If you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. Because <laughs> I said it. I did it. Of course you're trying to, to you're singling out Catholics because you know those dear hearts don't know anything about the Bible. And when we saw Catholics coming, we salivated. Oh, thank you, Jesus. This is going to be easy. Beware of non-denominational Bible studies. And I would say to you, do not get involved in them unless you know your faith. If you know your faith and you can articulate what the church teaches and what the church believes, fine, great. Because the first thing, you, first mistake you're going to make is when you go to this gathering of these very friendly and loving and kind and smiling people, You're going to feel so at home and so warm. <laughs> and they're going to tell you, we're just going to let the Bible speak. No, I'm not going to bring my tradition. You're not going to bring your tradition. We're just going to let the Bible speak. If you buy that line of thinking, you're lost. You're being set up. Because you cannot understand the Bible without its historical context. If you take the Bible out of its historical context and read it and try to study it, you can make it say anything you want it to say. And that's why we have 35,000 denominations. Because they take the Bible out of its historical context, out of its traditional context. And just try to understand it with their modern day minds. What saves us is our tradition. Our tradition is God's dealing with us through the ages. God's unfolding his, real, his wisdom to us. That's what our tradition is to us. We revel in our tradition. It's one of our treasures. Our apostolic tradition is a treasure. Because we have the teaching and the unfolding of the Paschal Mystery from the cross to us today. They don't have that. They don't want that. They want just the Bible. Never, ever subscribe to a Bible alone uh, theology. 
All right, now, let's get down to it. What do you don't do? First thing, before I say what to do, here's what not to do. Are you ready? Yes. All right, can I have 15 more minutes? Yes. Okay. Number one, this is what you do not do. If your son comes home or your wife comes home or your friend contacts you and tells you that I'm out of here, I'm going to another church, I've been converted, I've been born again, what do you do? First thing you do not do, do not think you are a failure, especially parents. Parents think that I've taken my kids to mass, I've taken them to catechism, they've had their first communion, they've had their confirmation, I've done all that I can do. And I'm talking about good parents, good Catholic parents. And then when the kids get about 16 or 17, they begin to walk away. Don't beat yourself for that because it happens all the time. And you're not responsible for their growing self-awareness. You're not responsible for them walking away when they've been given a, an opportunity to be converted, an opportunity to know the faith interiorly, and yet they walk away. And so many people, and I have heard them say, what did I do wrong? God, what did I do wrong? I thought I did everything right. I gave it my whole heart. I took them to class. I, I did what I was supposed to do, and the, the, but I didn't do enough because they walked away. No, don't beat yourself. We have free will. Did Judas walk away? Yes. Did he have free will? Yes. Absolutely. Don't view yourself as a personal failure. Second, don't allow feelings of anger and rejection and hurt to fill your heart. Don't let anger, rejection, and hurt make you bitter. I, I talked to uh, several people with tears in their eyes, but I could tell they had gone beyond just being uh, sorrowful. They were angry. After all I've done for this kid, he's gone away or she's gone away. If you allow yourself to become angry and hurt, what can you do to win them back? Nothing. Nothing. Love speaks more than knowledge. And if you've lost love in dealing with those who have walked away, you're not ever going to get them back. I don't care how much Bible you know or how much of the church teaching you know. If you take what you know and beat them over the head with it and just keep beating them and condemning them, they're going to run from you. So, don't allow bitter feelings and anger to well up in your heart. Three, I'll explain this in just a little bit. Number three, don't try to win them back. Don't try to win them back. Why? Yeah, they didn't hear you, so I'm going to keep on asking. <laughs> Why not try to win them back? Because they didn't come out of free will. Yeah. It, more simply, that's the technical answer. The real answer is you can't. Once they've made a decision to walk, I said once they've made a decision to walk away, just like I told you other, uh, before, if you feel that they're going that way, that's the time to act then. Once they've made the decision to walk away, to leave, you can't win them back because they have made a decision out of free will and they have sealed their heart over even before they tell you. They have sealed their heart over. And by the time they tell you, I'm out of here, there's nothing you can do to win them back. So stop trying to win them back. Number four, don't become a super apologist. As Patrick Madrid said, don't kill them with friendly fire. Now, what did he mean by that? Just inundate them with church teachings and, 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 and councils and dates and, and what the church said there, and what Pope said here, and, and the, all of that is just like water off of a duck's back. It, it just means nothing. 
And the more you try to do that, what will they do? The more they will begin to clam up and not receive what you say. I know we're zealous. I know we know the faith. I know that we want to share the faith. But my brothers and sisters, sometimes we can do overkill. Number five, don't be arrogant and contentious. Don't scoff at the reasons for leaving the church and or belittling their new faith. Don't do that because you are creating a barrier that's going to be difficult to cross. The Bible teaches this. A brother offended is more difficult to be won than a city taken. And if you offend them, insult their intelligence, if you are arrogant and talk down to them, if you scoff at their reasons for leaving, you do more harm than good. What should you do? Listen. Just listen. Don't try to heal every sickness. Just listen. Number six, don't become triumphalistic. You left the best church on earth and you're going to number four. <laughs> well, we all know that the fullness of faith subsists within the Catholic church. Am I right about it? Amen. Am I right about it? Amen. Now you gotta talk to me. Now come on now. <laughs> the fullness of faith subsists in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Am I right about it? Amen. All right. Thought maybe you might be a little sleepy. <laughs> so don't become triumphalistic and trying to put their new faith down while building up the Catholic faith. You know, I tell people all the time, you got to learn how to fish. And a lot of people don't know how to fish. To fish properly, you first need some bait and a hook. <laughs> you get that bait and the hook in the water, and when they bite, what do you have to do? You pull them out of the, you can't scale a fish in the water. You get them out of the water. Then you work with them. So what am I saying? Get them listening to what you have to say. Get them to hear you. Get them to receive you. Since they're opening their heart and mind and slowly reel them into the land and get your knife ready. <laughs> Seven, don't use guilt. You know, if your grandmother was living, she'd roll over in her grave. You've been Catholic for the last 2,000 years. Don't try to make them feel guilty because it won't work. If a person has received a conversion experience, you're wasting your time trying to make them feel guilty. Now, for the last uh, 10 minutes, five minutes, I want to tell you what to do to win them, win them back. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Let them go, but don't give up. Let them go, but don't you give up. What do I mean by that? Jesus instructed his disciples, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as dumb. To be wise, let them go. Because in the end, you can't bring them back anyway. And the more you argue, the more difficult they become. So let them go. But now, devise a master plan. <laughs> Devise a plan, have a plan. First in that plan, I'm going to pray. How many believe prayer works? Or do we just do it on Sunday to fill time? <laughs> we all know prayer works. How many have had answered prayers? We all have. A gracious Father gives us and hears us. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. For everyone that asketh receiveth. Everyone that knock the doors open. Everyone who seek finds. We know prayer works. So have a master plan. And in that plan, have much prayer time. So number one, let them go, but don't give up. Number two, you ready for this? Love them where they are and keep the lines of communication open. 
It's like my son raised up his heels against my wife and I when he was growing up. He wanted to be a thug. You know what a thug is? There was another name over here. In the... A what? A what? Oh, uh, no, thug. No, 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 thug. No, 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 baby, you way off there. <laughs> I know there's a group there that's called that, but a thug is a brigand. He's, um, um, oh, God, he's a, he's a criminal. He's a, he's a strong armor. He's a, not a nice person. My son wanted to be like that. He wanted to be tough, and he was. He was a fighter. He inherited that from me. He was a fighter. He inherited his good looks from his mama and is fighting for me. You know, he had a temper like I had a temper. And so, so he kicked it up his heels against us and left. And what did we do? We prayed. That's all we could do. We couldn't reach him. We prayed. We prayed. And I told my wife, love him where he is. Love him where he is. If you cut off the lines of communication, how can you ever talk to them? How can you ever exchange ideas? Number three, prepare yourself for interfaith dialogue. Learn about your faith and then learn about theirs. Learn what they believe. But first learn what? Your faith. Adult faith formation is one of the most important parts of parish life. Learning about your faith. Why do we do what we do? How do you f defend the concept of, of papal authority? How do you defend not worshiping Mary? How do you defend purgatory? How do you defend the church's development of doctrine? How do you defend the conciliar documents? How do you, these are things that we as Catholics must know, and more importantly, if a loved one of yours has walked away, you've got to prepare to do interfaith dialogue because questions are gonna come up that you've got to answer quickly and concisely. So prepare yourself for interfaith dialogue. Uh, three good books that I think are good that might start you in your way. Uh, Why Do Catholics Do That by Kevin Orland Johnson. What Catholics Really Believe, uh, Setting the Record Straight, 52 Answers to Common Misconceptions About the Catholic Faith by Carl Keating. A History of the Catholic Church by Thomas Bach and Cotter. And we got some books back here. Uh, with uh, Robert, uh, Robert, wave your hand, man. We've got books back here that will inform you about your faith. Prepare for interfaith dialogue. Number four, and I have to move quickly now. I've only got about three, four minutes. Pray for wisdom. It works. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach that it may be given to him. You can't be a bull in a china shop. God, give me how to deal with this. Remember I said, let them go, but don't give up, okay? Number five, and this is important. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to new conversion. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring conversion in your heart. If you've been kind of testy lately or kind of angry and kind of mean-spirited, allow the Holy Spirit to bring the gentleness of Christ and the love of God in your heart so that they can see it. If you've been combative and angry and bitter, allow the Holy Spirit to bring the gentleness of Christ in your heart. You go through a conversion that they can see. Oh, wow, something's happened to Dad. Oh, man, Dad, he used to come home and kick the dog. <laughs> Squeeze a little canary, stop all that singing, you know. <laughs> but something has happened to dad. Something happened to mom. She doesn't fuss as much. She's really nice. Let the Holy Spirit bring you to conversion. Give yourself to him. And when they see that you too have gone through a conversion, then your testimony has more, more weight. Uh, three, six. Find common ground. God's love, sacred scripture, love, righteousness, all the things that we have in common. So start finding things we have in common. Seven, ask questions about their new faith in a way that will bring understanding to you. People love to talk about their new faith 
In fact, they don't even need an excuse. They'll see you at the bus stop or wherever you are, and they'll say, are you saved? <laughs> and you're kind of a shock. Whoa. Do you know Jesus? Are you born again? How many of you have asked that question? Are you born again? Yeah. They can't keep it to themselves. So ask them about their faith. Why do you believe this? Why do Jehovah Witnesses don't not believe that Jesus is divine? Give me a reason. And while they're doing that, take notes. Because that will be something you will have to revisit. All right, number eight. And I'm going to have to cut it short here. Number eight. When you do dialogue, start with objective historical evidence for a Catholic church. What happened to the church after the last apostle John died? Most non-Catholics feel that the church began to slide into apostasy until it morphed into the monster called the Catholic church. For the first century or two, it was holy and pure, having the word of God that they read and they followed, living the New Testament and singing hymns and having love feasts. And when the last apostle died, it began to slip into oblivion until Constantine came along and went to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> That's what we believe. So start with objective historical fact. Ask them, what happened to the church after John died? I'll guarantee you they have no idea and slowly begin to read for them and show them that the church not only was well, but it grew. And even in martyrdom, it prospered until it overcame the world's greatest empire and became the church of the empire. It won. Start with objective truth. All right, now, number nine. Wait for an opening to share your faith about your church or any church teaching. St. Peter says 315, uh, sanctify the Lord in your heart and be ready to give every man a reason for the answer. Eventually it will come back to faith and you be ready to share your faith, share what the church really teaches. And that means that you're going to have to give some time to it. Number, what, what number was that? Number 11. I'm up to 10. This is number 10 then. I'm rushing. <laughs> Don't seek to win an argument, but seek only to clarify what the church really teaches. If they feel that you're trying to win an argument, what will they do? They'll get defensive. But if they ask you a question and you just answer that question, question as truthfully and as concisely as you can and then shut up <laughs> until they ask you another question. In other words, seek to clarify, and that's what an apologist is. An apologist seeks to clarify what the church teaches. A polemicist is one who argues the faith. We're not called to be polemicists, we're called to be saints who know our faith. And we're ready to give every man a reason for the faith that we have, a reason for why we do what we do, a reason for uh, practicing the way we practice. Number 11, love and wise words speak louder than good arguments. Love and wise words speak louder than good arguments. I remember Carl Keating and one of his lessons was teaching, you can win an argument and lose the war. You can win a debate and drive the people away from you. So that's not our goal is to win debates. Our goal is to bring conversion. And we do that by love and wise words. What was the last number? 11, 11. number 12. Simply invite Catholics to come home. The story is told over and over again of Catholics who really would think about coming home if someone invited them and simply said, come home. We talk about evangelization, right? 
and that the church is, 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 is calling for evangelization in the modern world, correct? And that we're to, we're to, we're to bring the gospel to the front forefront of society and in our culture, correct? But do you know where evangelization begins? It begins with us. It begins in the church. Evangelizing those who have been sacramentalized but not evangelized. Bringing about conversion in the church to those who have fallen away from the faith and don't come to mass or don't come to liturgy. Those are our first targets. And once we get all of these people together, those who have stopped practicing their faith, those who don't know their faith, those who are alienated from the church, who were once members of the church, once we get them on board, the others are as easy as pie because they'll see the love of God manifested in a way they've never seen before, and they want, they want to come and see you burn. All right. Number... 13, all right. Let God do the talking. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who touches the heart and brings about conviction. Let God do the talking. You do your part. You can't bring them back. Amen? Amen. But let the Holy Spirit do the work of conversion. And finally, finally, this is the last one radiate Christ's love, radiate Christ's love. Be an example of what Christ is. And that will do more to touch people's hearts, especially those who have walked away than anything else. When they see the love that you have developed in your life. My son uh, wanted to live a life in the street. If you're into hip hop, you've heard of Thug Life. If you're not into hip hop, you don't know anything about Thug Life. But uh, he was a, a, like a part of that generation. And one day he walked in and said that uh, he's going to move out. He's going to go live in this house on the corner, which was about a block away, that I knew to be a crack house and not a nice place to live. And so he went and there was nothing that my, his mother and I could do to stop him because he was 17 years of age. So what we did, we prayed. We prayed that God would give us what to do. We prayed day after day after day after day. We didn't know how to handle this. And finally one day when I was in school, I was teaching school at the time, uh, it just came in my heart to go get your son. And so I drove over to the crack house and I was very, very nervous because, you know, crack houses are noted for their violence. Uh, oh, that's right, I'm in Australia. Do you know what crack is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this society is so different than where I come from. I have to make sure that we're connecting here. Uh, and so I went in and knocked on the door, and this young man came to the door that was all gruffy and angry looking and hostile and confrontational. And he looked and he said, what do you want? And at that time, I thought I might have a fist fight right there on the porch. Now, I was an older man. He was a young guy. I had to be about 19. I couldn't have lasted long, but what time had lasted, it would have been a good one. <laughs> I was willing to fight to get my son out of there. That was my son. He was the one that, that came from me. He, he, he's mine. He has my genes. He has his mother's looks, but he has my genes too. You know? <laughs> and so I went there and I told him that I wanted to see my son, Ben. And he looked at me like he wanted some. And I said, you all don't know what that means. He didn't say nothing. Well, in America, when we say that somebody wants some, what do we mean? They want to fight, yeah. He looked like he wanted some, now it's going to give him some. <laughs> but he broke away and went and got my son and told my son, you come home with me now. And he looked at me, puzzled, and he said, all right, Dad. And he went and he packed his things and he came home. Two weeks later, his best friend was shot to death at that house. And he said, Dad, if I'd been there, they wouldn't have killed him. I said, yeah. That killed you. That's why the Lord put on my heart to come get you. And to this very day, he's appreciative. Now, he's grown 40 years old, 
has three kids, his own house, doing well. Now he thanks me for saving his life. That's what prayer can do, amen? amen. Absolutely not. Next question. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let me, just let me say this, that most Catholics who, who hear this all the time, that uh, were saved by faith alone, sola fide, which is faith alone, was not held by most uh, Protestants. I didn't believe in that. And so many of us didn't believe in that. We believe more uh, like Catholics that you had to live a life that was worthy of your faith. If you didn't, then your faith didn't mean a hill of beans. Uh, but there were Calvinists and people who believed that, that once you were born again, that you couldn't lose your salvation. You were saved by faith, by nothing you've done. Even baptism itself was a work. Uh, we didn't teach that. But there's a small sliver of, of Christians who do teach that. And the reason that everyone believes we all believe that is that they're very loud and vociferous. I mean, they're loud. They're the ones that, that scream the loudest. We were what, 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 what is called in Protestant theology, we were Armenians, not the national Armenians, but we followed the priest Arminius who taught that you could lose your salvation and you could forfeit, forfeit your birthright. We believe that and we live like that. We were a holiness church and our scripture was follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. That was our, our founding scripture. Uh, so we didn't share in uh, just faith alone. Uh, we didn't believe that. And I dare say most Protestants don't believe that. Well, you've got to have some kind of proof. But there are those extremists in that thought who say that once you believe in Jesus, that's that faith to get your cross. And I think it was uh, 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 Martin Luther who said that um, uh, uh, the righteousness is imputed to us like snow that covers the ground, the barnyard and it covers over the dung, and you don't see the dung because of the white snow. That was his theology, that, that God imputes to us righteousness, but that righteousness doesn't really change us. We as Catholics and as Pentecostals believe that, 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 that righteousness is not imputed, but infused into us, so that when we receive the life of God and the faith of God, it changes us. And we live for the better. That's what we believe.